2005, um, the Observer magazine heard that um, a brother and sister was seriously ill with bird flu in Vietnam. Uh, and they asked me if I would go there and write a story about this outbreak. Um, so um, basically I leapt on a plane. Uh, well, I should say before I leapt on a plane, I said, well, I really need to get a, a tutorial, a little briefing about the virology of flu. Uh, and the best known virologist who spoke on this subject was John Oxford. Uh, so I went to see him at uh, his office at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and I always remember I walked into his office and he had a desk there. And on that desk was uh, this wooden model of the influenza virus uh, that I've now since discovered uh, he had specially made by an artist in Cornwall. Uh, and he used to take everywhere on airplanes with him uh, until it set off one too many security buzzers and he had to retire it. Um, but basically he you know, gave me a whole exposition about um, the virus and you know, theories about its, um, how it spread from you know, ducks and chickens and gave me a whole rundown of the ecology of flu. So then I went to Vietnam and to cut a long story short, um, I ended up uh, at the French hospital in uh, Hanoi where they had uh, a special ward where this brother and sister were being kept on a ventilator as they were very seriously ill with H5N1. It, to even approach the ward, you had to get dressed in a full white biohazard suit. Um, and I arrived there at exactly the same time, I always recall this, that another journalist from the Daily Mail <laughs> arrived at the opposite end of the corridor. Um, I, however, had gone through all the correct procedures. I had a translator from um, the Office of Foreign Affairs, uh, blah, blah, blah. He had just walked in with a load of cash, and you know, so we ended up in the same place. But it was absolutely fascinating. Um, it coincided with a big international conference on bird flu, where a lot of the leading scientific experts, uh, a very famous um, researcher called Robert Webster, who was one of the first people to put together uh, the key role that ducks played in transferring the virus from uh, wild migratory birds to domestic chickens and then on to humans. Also there, since we're in this building, I met a young clinician uh, who was working at the Infectious Diseases Hospital in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. That was Jeremy Farrar, who's now the director of the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and he uh, had been, you know, he was, you know, Johnny on the spot when the outbreak happened and together with his Vietnamese colleague, uh, they diagnosed some of the earliest cases uh, in a young, a young girl actually who, who caught H5N1 from her pet duck. And what she'd done was she had a duck that died. She didn't know what it died of. It was buried, but she was so distraught that she disinterred the duck and in so doing must have got infected with the blood uh, which contained the H5N virus. So that was my interest, the beginning of my interest in flu. Um, and then, um, uh, so just fast forward um, to 2007, I enrolled, I decided this was an interesting subject for a PhD. So I enrolled at the Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine, Wellcome Centre actually for the History of Medicine, which was right here on the fifth floor, occupied the fifth and sixth floors. Uh, it was one of the leading world centers for medical history. Uh, great place to do a PhD. We had our own offices, rare thing for PhD students. Um, and um, uh, I was interested in, in, in at that point, um, there had been several um, American histories of the pandemic. So Alfred Crosby's book, America's Forgotten Pandemic, this always irked me somewhat because why, why is it that America owned this forgotten pandemic? Surely it wasn't just forgotten in America. Um, so I started to look for you know, sources from Britain. Um, and I began with the traditional thing, all the medical officer of health reports. So there was an official British government report on the pandemic that went to many, many pages. Um, but then uh, I discovered that the Imperial War Museum had a collection of letters um, that uh, Richard Collier, the uh, journalist, also a journalist, but later, then he became a popular mil military historian, and that nobody seemed to have really used uh, these letters or drawn upon them. Um, 
I then have to add very quickly that uh, because this was like 2008 and I realized that the 90th anniversary was looming, before I did the PhD, I decided I needed to write a book, a sort of medical history, but a, uh, um, an accessible, you know, history comes out. And that was Living with Enza. Um, Living with Enza, Britain and the forgotten story of the great flu pandemic. Um, but for that, I drew on lots of sources, but I drew on quite a few of the Collier letters. Um, uh, but that was a book that tried to marry history with science. So if you've looked at it, the first half of the book is historical, but in the middle section, I take the readers of Vietnam and talk about um, pandemic preparedness and then project forward to you know, what, what might happen if there was another pandemic. So that was my interest in flu. Uh, bird flu had made uh, influenza a very prominent subject in the media. So that meant that when we got to this time of year, October, November, um, usually, uh, you know, that's a big time. We have Armistice Day here on, you know, the first Sunday, the second Sunday in November, around November the 11th. So there are always big celebrations or commemorations of the First World War. Um, the influenza pandemic wasn't overshadowed. I mean, there was tremendous interest because bird flu was in the news. Um, that wouldn't, that's not normally the case. Um, I mean, to be f quite frank, even this year in the 100th anniversary, influenza is always going to play second fiddle to the war. I mean, you know, it's always going to be the main, that's going to be the main yeah. item on the agenda. Yeah. Um, but it's moved steadily up, I think. Well, I mean, it was certainly forgotten. It, it, was, it wasn't, I mean, people who lived through the pandemic or saw close members of their family perish, or doctors and nurses who treated uh, the sick on the front line, all said this was not something they would ever forget. And we know that from the scant records that those people have left. But for the vast majority of society, it hardly caused a ripple. So this is the problem. In order to forget something, it has to have um, entered collective public memory in the first place and my contention is it never did. Was there Hannah might have a different point of view. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think you're asking the wrong question. I think the, the better question is to ask why it is that some uh, disease outbreaks um, have cultural impacts in the first place. Um, the assumption that these things ought to be things that are seared in memory is, is in my view, a sort of kind of misreading. Um, so, uh, and this really, in order to answer that question, you really have to go to the science. This is why it's so important that <laughs> historical studies of influenza, but also other diseases, I mean, medical history is, is the interdisciplinary historical, um, uh, you know, it's a, a par excellence and interdisciplinary discipline because you can't write medical history without understanding how scientists thought about, and this is a crucial point, made certain pathogens or diseases objects of scientific inquiry. Um, and the point about influenza in 1918 was that the the bacteriology was always in dispute. They, they, thought it, they thought influenza was a bacteria, but um, they weren't able to consistently isolate it in every case of influenza. Uh, and the, and the, the big failing was they weren't able to pr produce a vaccine. So for the medical profession and science in general, it, it was a moment of failure, um, uh, a kind of shameful moment, if you like, um, so, without that triumphalist narrative, um, you know, th there wasn't an object to glorify. There wasn't anything on which to construct a narrative of success or sort of me uh, medical expertise. The other uh, point about influenza is that it's an incredibly widespread democratic disease. 
broadly speaking, and I know that there's now research that is challenging this idea, but at the time it was seen, at the time it was seen as, as a disease that just affected a wide cross section of society. Uh, and it made no difference whether you lived in a wealthy neighbourhood of London like Knightsbridge or Kensington or, or you were in the East End of London, okay? Uh, I mean, w Winston Churchill had a marvellous poem he wrote, not about the 1918 influenza, about, but about the previous epidemic of <coughs> Russian influenza. He, Winston Churchill captured this characteristic of flu, this, the, the democratic nature of flu, uh, as a 15-year-old schoolboy at Harrow. It was his first... Um, uh, real literary attempt, uh, a real, first real attempt at sort of writing, so writing uh, poetry. And his poem went, the rich, the poor, the high, the low, alike the symptoms know, alike before it drew. That says it all, right? Well, I mean, so, so first of all, I mean, we're living through a, a moment where there's tremendous ignorance of science. Um, huge distrust of vaccines and medical. So, I mean, in this moment of social media um, where huge you know, people are spreading disinformation and, and going to, um, you know, choosing who they listen to and what they take in, I think that underscores two things, the importance absolutely of history and really well-grounded you know, um, empirical archive footnoted history, but also the importance of realizing the great contribution that scientific medicine has made to human health and well-being. But also, and this is where um, the interdisciplinary, the, the historical approach to the history of science, technology and medicine can provide insights is that what you realize as a historian of medicine is that um, science proceeds by fits and starts and sometimes a, a particular paradigm is absolutely dominant but there are always areas that are uncertain or vague uh, and those and quite often um, scientists aren't always completely transparent or, or upfront about what they don't know. So, you know, we come, I, I constantly think of, you know, Donald Rumsfeld's famous passing of, you know, um, the philosophy of knowledge. There are things we, we know and there are things we, there are things we know we know and there are things we, we know we don't know and then there are things we don't know we don't know. What he f forgot to say or missed out is there's a fourth category. So, we have known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. But in medical science, in, and this comes up time again in the history of pandemics and epidemics, this is really the theme of my book that's coming out next year called The Pandemic Century. The most important category is the unknown known. So what do I mean by that? Or a more clear-cut example would be Zika. So the Zika virus was first isolated, identified in 1947. So scientists knew all about Zika, knew it was a virus, and it was a virus. But it took until 2015 for them to link it to this condition, microcephaly, these deformities in babies. So although it was known, there was a lot that was unknown about it. Uh, but my point is that knowledge can blind scientists and, by extension, public health authorities to the epidemic just around the corner. We saw this in 2009 when the whole world, the whole scientific community, all the flu experts in the World Health Organization were focused on bird flu in Southeast Asia. That was the, the variety of flu that they were expecting to trigger a pandemic. Nobody thought that actually the current circulating strains of human influenza and porcine influenzas would recombine in a new way in of all places Mexico and trigger the first influenza pandemic of the 21st century. So the big lesson I think is um, of course science can help us a lot and you know it can make vaccines against these things but there, you also have, have, there also has to be a, a large dose of hubris um, 
and not to become trapped by a particular paradigm. Apparently, at the moment, our paradigm for influenza is a, a virological one. It's all based on, you know, this rather complicated molecular science around the genomics of influenza viruses and how the proteins reassemble. Um, so, um, as a historian of science, that's my insight. Um, and I think that is particularly important now because it's not enough to sort of simply, as scientists or, you know, uh, you know um, my mother or parents' generation always trusted that doctor knew best and the doctor was the authority, whatever the doctor says. Um, I don't think doctors can assume that anymore. You know, they have to say, well, we know quite a lot, but we don't know everything about this vaccine. There could be some side effects, but all the studies, all the scientific studies, randomized controlled trials, the best evidence shows that you're, 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 you're more likely to be protected if you take this vaccine and help other people in society than not. So. No, I don't think he's the hero. I think the nurses were the, the nurses. The heroes or the heroines, yeah. I mean, obviously, he, yeah, I mean, I mean, Basil Hood is a marvelous figure, character. I mean, um, his photographic album and his notebooks are here. Um, and if you look at his whole medical career, um, when he, um, you know, uh, qualified as a doctor, he spent the first part of his career um, at a very poor, poor law hospital in the East End of London, where he worked with, I mean, basically it was, you know, poor working class women. Um, and, you know, at that stage, you know, children had all sorts of terrible conditions. Um, but it, it filled him with um, a, a kind of, you know, he had a calling for sort of social medicine, really. And that comes up very powerfully in his notebooks because the hospital, St. Marylebone Infirmary, which was the hospital he was medical superintendent of um, in October 1918 when um, the influenza epidemic hit, was a hospital for training nurses. Um, and in this country, you had the public hospitals which were funded by the boards of guardians of poor law and then you had what they called voluntary hospitals yes. which were really private hospitals and the nurses that worked in the private hospitals weren't in his view uh, properly trained and they didn't have the right spirit they weren't prepared essentially to roll up their sleeves and muck in with the really nasty dirty yeah. kind of tubercular cases or people with dysentery all those sort of uh, 19th century disease that thank God we've pretty much got rid of. Um, so what comes out in his notebooks is his tremendous uh, sense of um, care and you know uh, concern for his the for the well-being of his nursing staff and really I mean all through his diaries he's trying to mitigate the risks and protect protect them as much as possible but you know they're passionate about what they do and when their own colleagues fall ill they refuse you know to, to, to sort of isolate themselves they want to you know help them and the most you know moving part for me of the diaries is he 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 urges them all to wear these face masks but the nurse one of the nurse says I, I don't want to put the face mask on when I'm treating sister so and so because then she'll know how serious her her condition is so I, that's tremendously that really gives you an insight into what it was like. And these are very rare. We don't have good accounts like that. Yes, well, Phyllis Burns is really Hannah's discovery. So I think it's better that she talks about Phyllis. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, um, uh, I mean, Phyllis Burns in particular, that, her diaries are not at all well known. Um, and Hannah deserves great credit for bringing them back. I mean, you know, there was a book that came out, but nobody took much notice of it. Um, and also the other one is Vera Britton. Yeah. Um, so Vera Britton is very, very well known. Um, you know, her memoir, Testament of Youth, has been made into films, multiple films. And uh, she, she didn't really, she wasn't, she doesn't really describe um, the height of the pandemic, but she was at uh, this military hospital at a Tarpe in Northern France the previous winter. So she may have actually come into contact with early cases, we don't know. But she was on the pneumonia ward 
Uh, and then on her way back to uh, England when she had leave, she fell ill with an influenza-like illness. So that's, her accounts are quite useful. They give you some sense of the conditions of what it must have been like. So, I mean, I really think I, I have to sort of wear my hat as a historian here. It, it's not the job of historians to validate any particular current scientific theory. Um, one thing that studying history teaches you is that um, these theories, ideas change with, you know, each scientist or, you know, technology that comes along. I mean, but everything we know about pandemic flu, and we've seen this with our other epidemics in more recent times, is that usually the virus or the pathogen is already very w widely seeded before the first case emerges. So the whole concept of a patient zero is really um, uh, very misleading. There really is no such thing as a patient zero. In reality, there are usually lots of patients zero, uh, but it'd be one particular outbreak that becomes big enough that it comes to the attention of clinicians. What I will say is that the conditions were in place at lots of large army camps, not just at Atapla, but at these large US Army camps on the east coast of America. Um, I mean, I think really the strongest insights come from immunology. Um, and by the way, Alfred Crosby was aware of this and he writes about, if you look at his book closely, he's kind of onto this. The other researcher who, who, who also writes about it was Ka Caroline Byerly, whose book Fever of War. She drew very heavily on the ideas of the Paul Ewald, an evolutionary biologist. So in order to answer the question of where the 1918 flu originated, you have to be able to answer the question of why we saw this unusual signature of marked mortality in young adults between the ages of 20 and 40. So that tells you that this virus somehow um, didn't adapt to that age group. On the contrary, it killed that. Normally, that wouldn't be a good strategy for a virus. It's not a good idea for a, a parasite to kill its host. A successful parasite keeps, it, keeps its host alive long enough to spread to other hosts and thereby uh, continue its life cycle. So why would it be advantageous for the influenza virus? To answer that question, you then go to the conditions of the war. So what we saw was that in World War one, um, we brought large numbers of men from diverse immunological backgrounds and put them all together in these, these barracks. And then we, then we like, put them in trenches, you know, in these horrible conditions. Uh, and presumably only the fittest were left. So those were the only hosts available to this virus when it emerged. Um, that seems to me a very compelling theory. Um, that doesn't help with exactly where uh, it acquired those um, uh, mutations first. But you're looking for various um, things to be in place. One is, you know, a presence of birds and pigs near a wild migratory bird ground. That is certainly all in place at the Tarpla. Uh, also, we know there were Chinese laborers working behind the lines. So if Mark Humphrey's uh, theory that maybe the virus or maybe some influenza virus was brought from China and then it could have recombined with a bird or a pig virus. That could also have happened with a tarpler. Uh, but also we, we know in a Camp Funston, Fort Riley in, in Kansas, um, that was an area where there were lots of pig farms and chickens. And we know there were, that at the time, um, uh, the US Army had a whole commission on measles and pneumonia, which was examining conditions of all these kinds because they'd had huge outbreaks of measles because non-immunes, so rural farmhands who hadn't been exposed to measles or children, were catching it from city boys who had been put in the same camps. I mean, just really that it, it's, it's such a rich subject. Um, I mean, I had no intention that I would still be writing about it. But it is remarkable. I mean, I just gave a, a lecture um, last night in Liverpool. Um, 
and, and to, to do it, I had to re-engage with material again, but in a new way. And it's astonishing to me how still I was finding kind of insights um, about the interaction of science and history. Um, so there's, there's, for me, the most interesting thing is the historiography, why it is that certain books or why certain science gets done at a certain time, um, and uh, how um, some scientific research or some books on the flu get validated, or certain narratives get taken up as though, and then another book comes along and says, well, actually, you know, we might want to reconsider that. That's certainly the case. I mean, the best example I can give of that is the most iconic photograph of the 1918 pandemic, which gets reproduced in virtually every book, TV series, or exhibition, is this picture of all these um, men in an emergency influenza ward of Camp Funst and Fort Riley. It's this big hangar, and they're all in cots, makeshift cots. But you look closely, so this picture is held up as the what has been put as the first outbreak of what was probably the pandemic virus. It's a picture that was taken in around March of 1918 when they had this outbreak of what they called three-day fever or knock-me-down fever. Uh, and it's Pride of Pace in John Barry's book on the Great Influenza, which is certainly the market-leading title. George Bush took it as a summer reading um, around the time of the Gulf War, I believe. Maybe it was a bit late, no, it would have been later than that. That was the first George Bush, but um, during the invasion of uh, uh, Iraq. Um, but the remarkable, if you look at that photograph, all the men are, look perfectly well. They're sitting around smiling. It looks to me very much like a stage photograph that probably the US Army uh, put out to show how great medical care was and conditions were not because they were concerned about flu at the time, but because of the concerns around measles and pneumonia. But retrospectively, um, because of the epidemiolo you can, you can trace a ch an epidemiological chain from the earliest reports in a public health journal through Camp Funston, through to the later outbreaks uh, on the American transports through to Northern France, so a historian can construct a compelling narrative from that epidemiological chain. But this is where science comes in. Unless you interrogate that historical story with the scientific evidence. Uh, and there are all sorts of problems when you start to do that. Um, particularly, I think some of the most interesting work around this is being done by people like Sven Eric Mamelud uh, uh, in Norway, because they've, they've by by going uh, and looking in more detail at the um, statistics, the epidemiological reports at the time of these um, outbreaks that were seen in the summer in Copenhagen, but also in other cities in Europe. So this is June, July of 1918. They also see this signature excess mortality in this 20 to 40 age group. But just in some isolated places. So this is, this is exactly how, what we know about pandemic viruses, that when they're trying to get up and run, running in populations, they have little bursts here, little bursts there. And that's when you see these signals, when clinicians notice them and uh, a, a records are kept in their file. And these were all what looked like signature bursts. So how is it possible that this could have started in March if in June and July we're seeing these signature births in Copenhagen, which is a long way from the Western Front. It is. It's possible, I mean, you know, it's, but it looks less likely. So I think, it's, I think this is why medical historian, the way I'm saying medical history or historians of science, technology and medicine really always have to be aware of how present day science can affect the way you interpret archives and change um, you know, the archives aren't there, the facts aren't just sitting in the archives waiting to be dis discovered. They're always being filtered through our understanding of what is important, what is not important, and that is very much affected by current day scientific theories. Well, I've always thought that alongside the red poppy, which I'm wearing here, <laughs>
very important to, you know, honour, you know, the sacrifices um, of British servicemen and you know, servicemen from other Commonwealth countries in 1918. I've always thought that there should be a second ceremony, um, and we, we, you saw the animation we did. The, I, the idea of having like a purple blue poppy that you can also wear to symbolize. So after all, we have this with other diseases. There's the AIDS ribbon, there's the cancer ribbon. Why not the cyanosis poppy to commemorate people like um, the nurses um, at Samaritan Infirmary and, and, the, and all the soldiers who, who, who all died of flu alongside you know, those who died of battle wounds. I mean, quite, well, there, there are multiple reasons. I mean, first of all, in 1918, the war had all the best narrative lines. There, there was, you know, no one, no journalist, and no historian certainly, was interested in writing a history of the flu until 1958, okay? Why was that? Because it wasn't until 1957 that we had a second pandemic. But more importantly, it wasn't until the 1950s that scientists knew enough about the vi virology of influenza and had the possibility of studying it and growing vaccines in chicken eggs. So until there was a, a way of anticipating and maybe preventing you know, the worst impacts of the epidemics. Uh, historians simply weren't interested. It, it wasn't validated as, as, uh, an in, uh, as, a, as an object of scientific inquiry and therefore of, of historical interest. Um, also remember that though um, the pandemic was terrible for those who uh, died or saw family members died, in Europe and North America, that was only 2% of the population. 98% of the population had a mild illness or no illness at all or unaffected. And John Oxford um, was very good on this because he said that, because he, he taught at the Royal London Hospital, when he looked back through diaries and letters from medical students, there, there were people who, who, who were practicing medicine who didn't even really realize the flu was going on around them because they, they were focusing on other things. That's why. Um, but also, um, it never became politically expedient to remember the sacrifice and courage of clinicians and doctors and nurses. I mean, they were every bit as courageous as the people who died in the war, but there weren't, um, you know, family members um, campaigning afterwards for some sort of memorial. Uh, and this is what happened, and, you know, we, in, in the United Kingdom there was a War Graves Commission that was specifically set up to deal with all those bodies that didn't have uh, marked graves, you know. And that's why we have these huge cemeteries in northern France um, and other parts of the world. And then after that, of course, you know, Edward Lutyens was commissioned to do the cenotaph. Um, so, it really comes back to this idea that the flu, unlike, say, HIV AIDS, didn't stigmatize and mark out a particular social group. It was never politicized. So what's interesting is where do you see kind of memorials? So there's a Maori memorial. Yeah. And, but what we know about the flu is in those remote, more isolated communities where uh, the indigenous populations hadn't had much exposure to flu. It behaved, and this is um, Crosby's phrase, like a virgin soil. Yeah. So it wiped out 60% and some in Alaska, 80% of the population. So when you see something like that, that is a major catastrophe. It's like the Black Death, yeah. right? Yeah. It's a real, that's a real play. If there were to be, you said, I mean, I'm not really campaigning for anything. No, no, no. I mean, um, you know, my, my memorial, if you like, and my books and, and the podcast. But um, I would certainly like to see some sort of um, monument or memorial to all uh, frontline health workers, not just for influenza, but for Ebola, yes. HIV, AIDS. I mean, it's 
they're, they're always the first to spot these things and, and the first to risk their lives. So, so uh, I started my career as a journalist. I was a journalist for more than 20 years. Um, and whenever there's an outbreak or an epidemic or pandemic, whatever, um, newspapers, journalists are often accused of spreading hysteria and panic. I actually think that that's, that's um, uh, it's unfair, really. I mean, of course, there are some bad reports and science journalists who do contribute to this. But where, does, where do these messages start? I mean, journalists, science, are just the messengers. It's actually science and public health that is um, the root source of those anxieties. Um, so what you have to realize is as soon as it becomes possible to study any sort of pathogen um, and devise vaccines, then a whole industry, a whole research industry, but a whole industry of public health prevention and preparedness. So pandemic, pandemic preparedness is a huge global industry, okay? Massive. People make professional careers out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, for the, for the most part, that's a really important job. It's important to, you know, forewarned as forearmed. I definitely believe that. Um, but you also have to recognize that in spreading these messages about it's not if there'll be a new pandemic, it's when. We're constantly told that. Um, the, there's a danger of crying wolf. There's a danger that the more you say that and the less often the much feared pandemic you know, occurs, or as in 2009, we had a pandemic based on the science, but actually it wasn't that severe. Um, so that actually contributes not only to panic and maybe needless hysteria sometimes, but also a distrust uh, in the science. Kind of fatigue, yeah. And pe people get, yeah, if you like, epidemic fatigue, or whatever you, you want to call it. Um, so really, I mean, I, I, I'm not using that phrase industry for to really criticize I think it's important but I but I also think we need to recognize uh, that the general public very quickly gets amnesia actually you know in 2015 we had uh, Donald Trump tweeting about Ebola and spreading all sorts of nonsense uh, and you know xenophobia he was tweeting things like it's all very well for these health workers to go to Sierra Leone, Liberia, and, and help, but don't, they shouldn't be bringing these foreign diseases back into U, the U.S. of A. Um, but now most people have forgotten, you know, what uh, a dangerous moment that was, and that was. So I mean, I, I think that, you know, we have to be very careful because actually the Ebola epidemic was a moment where these fears could have been realised. Yes. But it didn't help people spreading erroneous uh, and unfounded information. Um, uh, but likewise, you know, we have to be careful about only focusing or overly focusing on something like influenza, because what we've seen this century is we had, you know, the swine flu pandemic was mild, and then we were caught hopping with Ebola, and Ebola hadn't finished before we had an outbreak of Zika, which nobody saw coming either. <laughs> So basically, the, the book surveys eight uh, pandemics and epidemics, some very well known, uh, like the, um, I start with the Spanish influenza, I also do HIV, AIDS, uh, finishes with Ebola and Zika, but in between I survey some others. Uh, there was an outbreak of pneumonic plague in the Mexican quarter of Los Angeles in 1924. I did not know that. Uh, but my favorite is the great parrot fever pandemic of 1930. <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> Well, uh, without going into too much detail, um, in the 1920s, um, before we had FM radio, um, house, you know, homemakers, housewives uh, would keep pet parakeets and parrots because, you know, the chirping and conversation uh, kind of was seen as company. It was especially popular with, you know, widows, and there were these itinerant peddlers who every Thanksgiving went door to door with pet parakeets. The problem was uh, a lot of these parakeets originated in the Amazon, uh, 
and they harbored a bacteria called Chlamydia sitikai, which uh, when it, uh, it, it can, when the birds defecate and flutter their wings, these desiccated droppings are aerosolized and these tiny particles float through the air. And basically what happened is little old ladies were having coffee clutches in California all over the States. And within days they dropped dead of atypical pneumonia. And this happened all over the world. No, it was awful. Um, but this, this was a big, um, you know, um, the Hearst newspapers got onto it very early and it was a big, uh, a big tabloid story. Um, again, it was a classic example of panic. They called it a pandemic, but uh, only, I think, 800 people worldwide actually died of it.